what I did my graduate work with Adam Chico at Colorado State University. So unfortunately he wasn't be able to be here today, but I'm gonna to try to be as enthusiastic as he is for anyone who knows him. And so in the Chico lab, we're interested in cardiolipin in that the potential role the phospholipid composition may play in the development as well as the progression in heart failure. And so one model we use in our lab is the spontaneously hypertensive heart failure rat, the SHHF rat here. And so it's this rat down here, and it, what it happens is that it develops chronic hypertension around three months of age, and it goes through the remodeling process that we see similar in humans and where there becomes a hypertrophic stiff heart. Um, through a compensation mechanism, and then eventually becomes a very dilated and weak heart, and then they enter into actual heart failure. And so we look at the progression of tetralinyl cardiolipin in these hearts, and here are their heart failure rats. And you see as the rats age and progress into heart failure, you see in both mitochondrial cell population we look at, there's a loss in tetralinyl cardiolipin. Um, in another rat model, Sprag dollies, they really don't show any cardiac um, phenotype until they're aged, and so that's when you see the decrease in the older rats, and then your Fisher Brown Noise or your considered healthy aging rats, which don't really have any type of cardiac um, phenotype as they age, and so they pretty much don't really have a loss in that tetralinyl cardiolipin. But the kind of the, the foundation of a lot of the work we initially started with was the idea that there was a correlation between loss of tetralinyl cardiolipin and a decrease in the activity of cytochrome C oxidase. So it's the idea that, you know, cardiolipin composition, tetralinyl cardiolipin, seems to be important in the activity of the electron transport chain in this model. And so we were pretty intrigued with this particular model in that, you know, with the signature phospholipid um, composition, we were interested in, well, what's the cardiac mitochondria in these, li these mice like? And so we got the, happily we got the mice from Zaza, and so we started playing with the heart cardiac mitochondria and see what it looks like. And so I'm gonna show you some respiration data that I believe Adam did present two years ago, and then we kind of did a little, kind of an update so you can see where it's going. And so we came in with a question, you know, what are the possible effects of systemic tafazin deficiency on cardiac mitochondrial function. And so we did respiration data, and these are with the, with the Ouroboro, so it's just basically a fancy Strathcalvin Clark electrode. And so we did, again, um, similar to Chuck Hoppel's lab, where they look at both mitochondrial cell population, the SSM being the subsarcolemma, the ones right underneath the plasma membrane, and the interfibular mitochondria, the ones that are between the myofibrils. And so when we give a mitochondria pyruvate amylate, you see that there's a decrease in mitochondrial respiration, your state three or oxygen consumption in our TAS knockdown mice. And then we also gave them succinate rotenone to assess complex two. And that was also down, not as much, but there's a slight decrease in respiratory um, function in state three anyway. And we also looked at individual complex one and complex for activity, and saw that both of these were decreased. But the fact that our data with the palmitate and pyru um, sorry, the pyruvate and pal um, malate is decreased more severely than your succinate, suggests to us that the respiratory defect seems to be more upstream above complex two. And so the next question we were curious, we had isolated mitochondria, why not take advantage of it and look at the other substrates? And so we wanted to look at fatty acids as well as glutamate. And so just a reference point, we have pyruvate and malate just here. And then we looked at, for fats, we used palmitate carnitine. And that was also decreased to similar amounts. And what was interesting, and I know um, Michael Kibish showed this also in his skeletal muscle, that we see that glutamate respiration is elevated in our tasmite. As you can see also, if you look at the actual absolute values, they can respire with glutamate better than what the wild types did with pyruvate, suggesting that if you give it technically maybe the correct substrate, the mitochondria can respire, so maybe the defect is more upstream than the actual electron transport system. And so we wanted to confirm that what we saw with the glutamate um, respiration data was not just an isolated mitochondrial phenotype. So we also did this in permalized muscle fibers, um, where it's in the same system with the aerobros, you just tease the muscle fibers out and then you give them the appropriate substrates and see how they respire. And we see that, again, 
with fats and carb, at least with palmitate and pyruvate respiration is down to the slim amount, about 50%. And then again, glutamate was elevated um, in our heart, TAS knockdown mice, suggesting that uh, maybe the defect is more upstream, and so it's possibly the impairment of transport of the actual fatty acid, as well as the pyruvate or the oxidation itself into the mitochondrial matrix. And so how is it a TAS deficient can selectively pick out and affect pyruvate and fatty acid oxidation but not affect glutamate? And so some prior work has been done looking at when cardiolipin content has been altered. You see that ch changes in cardiolipin content can affect, influence pyruvate transport as well as fatty acid transport in itself. And so maybe given the known phospholipid signature of the cardio of bar syndrome, possibly that that's the reason why we're seeing a substrate-specific effect on these two particular substrates in our mice. Um, but for us, we were really intrigued about the glutamate. We were really scratching our heads, like, what's so special about glutamate? Others have seen it, at least with glutamate, respiration should be a little elevated in tasmai. So we were curious, what made glutamate oxidation so unique and that the mice could respire with this particular substrate? And so... Looking at the mitochondria, here's the electron transport system down here. And what you have is palmitate will have to be transported in with CPT and eventually has to be activated before it goes through beta oxidation. And then on the top side, you see you have malate and pyruvate. And again, it also has to be transported and then enter the TCA cycle to make these reducing equivalent. What kind of stuck out to us is that there's these CoA steps. And with glutamate, how glutamate gets in when you use glutamate as a fuel, glutamate first has to be transported into the mitochondria through the glutamate aspartate shuttle. And what's unique about glutamate is you see a glutamate can be um, con converted to alpha ketoglutarate, which eventually can be transported out. Um, and you, in the end, glutamate oxidation is really looking a lot of malate oxidation through malate dehydrogenase. So what was striking in this, looking at this, is I can see glutamate oxidation seems to be independent of the CoA steps. And so another assessment we also looked at was we did metabolomic analyses on our hearts. And what was interesting here is that pentothenic acid is decreased in our TAS hearts about 40% decrease. And the reason why we thought that was interesting is that pentothenic acid is a essential precursor to the biosynthesis of CoA. So if you have decreased pentothenic acid, most likely you'll affect CoA biosynthesis. We also looked at CoA content in the actual cardiac mitochondria. We also saw a similar decrease, about 43% reduction in mitochondrial CoA content in our TAS mitochondria. And so you see CoA, part of the activation of fats and CoA throughout here through utilization of pyruvate as well to enter the TCA cycle. And so glutamate seems to be its own little island in that it can still be oxidized and provide your reducing equivalent NADH independent of these CoA steps. So that's one way we were attempting to possibly explain the increased glutamate oxidation rates we've seen in TAS mice. So you know, is this really true? Is it a, a, a possible therapeutic approach? So some deficiencies um, that's been shown with CoA deficiency anyway, what, what does it affect? So it's been shown to affect glu both the oxidation of glucose and fatty acids, and there's some increased taurine excretion and effects on adrenal function and um, effects on the synthesis of cholesterol. Um, a while ago, about in the early 90s, one patient diagnosed with Bar syndrome did get the treatment with pentothenic acid, and that proved to be a positive, a beneficial effect on this particular boy. Um, Ten years later, they attempted to repeat the study with three separate boys, two of whom are brothers, and they didn't show any benefit. So it kind of just killed the idea that pentothenic acid might be a good thing. Um, but given that we had such a striking pentothenic acid and CoA deficiency in what we saw in our cardiac tissue as well as isolated mitochondria in our TAS mice, we were just curious, what would happen if you gave back CoA to these mitochondria? Would they do better? And so we came with the question, is CoA limiting in the mitochondria? And that's why it's affecting palmitate as well as pyruvate metabolism. And so an old paper in the late 80s showed that 
in isolated um, heart mitochondria from rats. They were able to incubate, provide exogenous CoA, and the mitochondria were able to take up the CoA. So we use this paper as a foundation for a design of our experiment that we wanted just to incubate the mitochondria with CoA and see if that would restore the amount of CoA in our mitochondria. And so the design of the study is that in CoA, we took isolated mitochondria and we incubated with CoA as well as ATP. It was an ATP-dependent process. So we incubated for 20 minutes. Afterwards, we repelled the uh, mitochondria and washed away any excess CoA that was not taken up. Um, the control was the same process, just no CoA. And what we saw is that yeah, both mitochondria will take up um, CoA based on the increase of CoA content in our isolated mitochondria. But we see that in the TAS mice and the CoA incubation, it goes to levels where the wild type had before. Um, so suggesting that maybe CoA transport is not defective in these TAS mice. And so we have increased CoA. Does it actually affect respiratory function? And looking at respiratory function here is the isolated mitochondria. And we start off with um, pyruvate malate respiration. And so your red and your gold um, is your wild type and a wild type with CoA incubation. And between just those two, you can see with CoA incubation, there's really no effect on the actual respiration with our substrates. In TAS, you see TAS itself is decreased respiration. And when we re replenish the CoA content in our isolated mitochondria, respiration is increased when pyruvate, malate respiration, and it continues to further increase more when you give it glutamate. And this is just a graph that summarizes the effect of the CoA actually on the respiration for our different um, TAS and wild type mice. Um, to also verify this, we also want to do this in cardiac um, tissue. So we did it in the permalized muscle fibers, and we saw the similar phenotype in that when you restore or so-called rescue CoA in our TAS hearts, which is near blue, you can see that it's elevated with palmitate or fat. And then when you give the subsequent substrates, such as pyruvate and glutamate, respiration is pretty much restored to wild-type levels with the CoA incubation. So this was interesting in many ways for us that, you know, maybe the CoA deficiency in our given mouse is real and that the decrease in um, CoA is not due to the actual transport from the mitochondria. So again, we keep moving upstreams as we knock down these barriers. And... So another thing we also looked at, just to kind of help possibly explain what we're seeing, so we took a snapshot by looking at the proteomics of our cardiac mitochondria. And these are the interfibular mitochondria. And what you see is that malate dehydrogenase, which we were you know, hypothesizing is elevated to allow the utilization of glucose, I mean, not sorry, glucose, um, glutamate, that's slightly elevated um, in our TAS mitochondria. Um, other things that were elevated were also related to the stress protein, so maybe suggestive of some of the defect and the loss of certain complexes or super complex that needs to be degraded. Um, as what's lower in our TAS mice, the mitochondria, we have ACAD9 is decreased, and ACAD9 has been shown to be essential in complex ones, um, the assembly of complex one super complex, and then several of the subunits of complex one are actually also decreased decrease in our mitochondria. So this graph just summarizes both the metabolomics and proteomics data in that it's a heat map. Green meaning it's anything's elevated. Red is a decrease in our um, hearts. And so, you know, the, as with any omics or big data, it's hard to know, given it's just a snapshot, if this is, shows a cause um, or an effect due to TAS deficiency, or this is all compensatory in what we see in our data. And so, some of it explains what we're seeing, and some others we're not too sure in that way. And then just some last thoughts about the data with the CoA. So we, we see that there's a um, decrease in pentothenic acid, um, which is a precursor for CoA. We see that CoA is actually down in our mitochondria. When we restore it, it the mitochondria respire like a normal, healthy, wild-type mouse. And so we wanted to see if the transport was an issue, and that's when we incubated and saw no issue in that way. So again, it suggests something that's upstream. So upstream of that would either be the synthesis of actual CoA or the absorption through the gut. And so this is kind of just an idea throwing out there and seeing what you guys think. But we did a little initial attempt by just looking at some morphology of our guts. And so we took some sections from the gut and we, with a 
colleague, they did some electron microscopy of our guts and to see what the intestine looks like. And so here's the wall type mouse. You can see um, they took a section here. And for the most part, I mean, we're not in any way an intestinal epithelial group. And so to me, that looks normal. And the mitochondria don't look abnormally strange, I don't think. Um, but looking at the TAS mice, it's just different. We don't know how to, to really want to describe it since we don't know. But you definitely see these strange vacuolization, um, as in what's composed in those little white blobs we don't know. But there's def definitely something striking in the intestine, which we found very interesting that you know this disease has been characterized always in hearts and in muscle and um, and neutropenia, so you know, for looking at the intestine, we found that this is a very striking morphology we're seeing in the tasmai. So um, possibly we're going down this route of looking maybe this disruptive um, structure leads to some type of defect in the absorption of certain vitamins um, for our tasmai's, which could possibly explain the pentothenic acid decrease we're seeing in our tasmai's. And so just to conclude, you know, while we do see defects in the respiratory chain, um, it seems minor in that given the correct substrate, such as glutamate, the respiration is fine. And so more it's upstream of that. So we, either it's the, um, the synthesis of the reducing equivalent, such as NADH, um, as well as the CoA availability so that you cannot use pyruvate and palmitate, as well as in the TAS mice. And so... The selective impairment seems to be because these two substrates, your carbs and your fats, are dependent on CoA. And for that reason, we're going to start possibly just looking into uptake absorption as well as synthesis of the pentothenic acid and CoA in our TAS mice and go that route. So I want to just acknowledge Adam Chico for being Adam Chico. Um, he's a character, I think. And so I had a very positive experience as my PhD. Um, thanks to him and our collaborators, obviously, Jessica and Adam, who did the proteomics and the metabolomics data, Zaza for sharing the mouse. Um, obviously, the funding from the Bar syndrome, without that, there's no data. And this little guy for giving his life to us. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we have time for questions. When you measured the CoA, did you measure only free CoA or did you measure a sterified CoA as well? It, I believe the kit was only measuring CoA, free CoA. So one of the things that could be happening is that the CoA pool is being depleted, the free CoA pool is being depleted because it's being esterified with other metabolites such as 3-methylglutaconic. Yeah. And then you are, you're, you're just losing some of the free CoA available but not the entire CoA pool, so you'd want to look at the esterified CoA as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. The, uh, this has always been a puzzle, the one child who clearly got better. And I can say there, there was that article later where three patients were treated, but probably about every child in the country got pantothenic acid. Uh, after that, after that r report, and uh, there was no effect seen. But it's giving pantothenic acid is quite valuable in treating some other mitochondrial problems, especially if they're sensitive to carnitine, um, as Barth kids are. They can get worse on carnitine. And the other action that it has, it acts with the way we, the reason we use it, it acts as a metabolic switch. Um, in activating complex one, so it's a major part of our treatment. Um, so it's, it's something which, uh, even though the clinical change was not seen, it could be an element in that child was extreme, and it so mm. could still be an element worth exploring. The other comment is in terms of the glutamate hypothesis, we have uh, unpublished data, but it's very strong showing there's a, a, a clear block. Uh, we, we measure citric acid cycle intermediates in plasma and in cells, too. There's a clear block at... Uh, the level of isocitrate de dehydrogenase so that the, we think that the reason that patients have low R gene is because that's converted into alpha-ketoglutarate as an anaprotic uh, source. And, and we see high levels of citrate implying that the, uh, what is incorporated 
uh, the acyl CoA that is incorporated in the citrate isn't getting into the citric acid cycle, and some of that is uh, diverted into saturated fat. So I think the the explanation for the glutamate uh, oxidation that you see is probably that. At least that's consistent with the other data. But I. Um, but the CoA is still a very intriguing question and yeah. worth thinking about. I have a, the observation about the intestine was interesting, and I just had a question. Uh, what was the control for that? Uh, um, in particular, because we treat these mice to knock down the TAS with doxycycline, mm -hmm. which alters the gut flora. So I'm wondering if that was controlled. Yeah. Or... So our control of type are also on doxycycline. Okay. And so we did some still see that drastic phenotype. I don't know what that is. Right. 